School is in. But are you really ready to learn? Open your eyes to a new day in education with The Awakening Educator, a program specifically designed to explore a new mindful way of educating our youth. Learn about social-emotional learning, new modalities of teaching, and the most relevant topics in education with your hosts, Susan Andrian and Megan Sweet. Susan and Megan will take you inside the issues by looking at them from different points of view, from policies and research to teaching models that are actually used in schools. There's never a dull moment in this classroom. Have any questions you'd like to ask? Maybe you have knowledge you'd like to share and share your thoughts live on air. Grab a pen and paper and get ready to open your textbooks and minds to a new way of learning on The Awakening Educator. Just in case. Okay. Now we know how to do it, too. So we've learned something new today. But yeah, it's such an honor to work with you, Susan. I always have so much fun. I love your perspective. Uh, it's really inspiring for me. And um, I think it's just made for a really powerful show. So I'm really glad that we're back for season two. I'm glad we took a break too, actually. So yeah. um, I think that was good as well. So we start off with history. This is what I was rambling about before um, the last one, <laughs> the last video <laughs> shut down. So I won't ramble as much. I feel like that was a sign. Um, but we start out with history and we interviewed some really powerful guests. Um, and really what we did, mostly I think the theme was centering um, civic engagement around understanding our history. So all of our guests talked about different areas about that. And um, that feels super relevant for today, doesn't it, Susan? It, it really does feel very relevant to, for today. And I feel like the, we are at a time that people are going to be studying in history, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're making history right now. And I, and I was totally. thinking particularly about Nicola's uh, project, right, where they untangled thing from a really, things from a really human perspective and put it and give kids the opportunity to um, learn about history through first source material and to grow. Mm -hmm. And I sort of think about right now that people are going to be looking around back at what happened uh, and how we manage this incredibly um, difficult and painful time. And I always, from the very beginning of the pandemic, have asked, how do we emerge from this better than we came in? And I am starting to see um, bubbles of hope of change in terms of how we do stuff. So I, I'm glad we're looking back. I think that, as we said during the history series, looking back, we look back to learn, to move forward. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about history and just civics and how to get active and how to how do we bring the that sort of thoughtful critical perspective back into education so that kids can make informed decisions about their future yeah i appreciate you saying that and and the idea of civic education is so important and i think for a lot of us we've been disillusioned over the last four years um, because of the way that our government's been functioning and um and there is this new hope and this new fire and um, in fact, I'm feeling so hopeful that I'm running for school board in my local town. And um, well, I thought I had a kind of a handle on that and I knew what being, what like that kind of civic engagement meant. It's actually been profoundly humbling and inspiring to be a part of this process in my mm -hmm. town. It's made me feel really proud and connected to my town in a way that I wasn't before. Um, and makes me really appreciate the, the contribution and the effort that, that our leaders put into um, trying to make their communities or, or our country a better place. And I'm, I'm really hopeful for, um, I'm, my hope is for just knock down, like home run civic engagement in November. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, current event things that really raise my attention, especially related to this topic are, um, you know, we interviewed Dante who talks about uh, the history of racism and racial um, prejudice in the United States and how mm -hmm. that's showing up today. And boy, has that been relevant always, but yeah. uh, with George Floyd and with the death of Brianna and others of just of I what's think. happening in the, the community in, the, in our country. I think people are, are waking up to that history of racism and bias in a way that many didn't before. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really excited about that. 
And um, yeah, even just this recent action around the post office and just this war about the post office. I yeah. mean, it's incredible, right? It's, it's really incredible. And I think I, even hearing my, my son talk about it or my daughter talk about it and knowing that the conversations are happening, that young people are, are exploring the, the systemic way in which they are trying to dismantle mm -hmm. uh, democracy, which is in this moment when people are in shelter in place, it's been the most difficult and painful, but it's also what's inspired me is to see this, the, the huge outpour of activism that young people have been able to, to pr come up with at this time. Um, yeah. And that's what keeps me hopeful. Uh, yeah. So knowing our history, having young people know their history and participate in what is absolutely a historical moment to then emerge from this with a better education system, with a, with a stronger uh, community and stronger education experiences. Yeah, I do feel like we're really rebuilding. Um, so our second series was summer. Yes. <laughs> this, was, this was this time last year. It was. <laughs> and we spoke to three, we had three really different um, people that we spoke to. The first one was Jennifer Rue, who left education and um, became a restaurateur. And actually, I'm thinking about her and her, her yeah. family a lot today because um, she opened a restaurant in Carmel Valley. And this will be the second um, time in three years that her restaurant and her community has been threatened by the wildfires um, mm -hmm. in the area. And also I've been thinking about her a lot during the shelter in place and being a restaurateur um, mm -hmm. in this moment in time is incredibly painful and difficult. Uh, Jennifer talked to us about what inspired her to be a teacher and what skills she uses as a teacher um, now that she's not in the restaurant anymore. Yeah. What, what it makes me think about now and, and, and about that show is actually a conversation that's been coming a lot, up a lot at my office, which is how do we support teachers as they're teaching online? Mm -hmm. And one of the main things that I kind of keep coming back to, and I, and I don't say it with any kind of like, I say it with every bit of humility, but also a lot of hope that actually so much of what being a teacher is are skills that translate online. It can feel yeah. like they're not, but they absolutely do translate. And so many mm -hmm. of the ways that we can be strong and effective as teachers do translate online. And, and I've just been wanting to give that message of hope to educators. So, I mean, I've been in some incredible Zoom meetings of watching teachers use their teacher skills and their teacher moves um, and being able to identify development. I mean, it's hard. It's a lot harder for them. It is it's harder. In, but, but they are... Mo many, many teachers are rising far beyond what I think um, folks would have expected in being able to engage. And, and many of our schools in, in Oakland who are 100% free and reduced lunch have 100% of attendance mm. right now um, in their classroom and not just attendance participation. So we think about like all the work that was done over the summer and how many, I mean, back to our, our, our series on summer, so many teachers gave up their summer mm -hmm. uh, to be ready for this moment. Um, yeah. And I appreciate them for that. Yeah, it's made me kind of appreciate the teaching profession and fall in love with teachers all over again. And, you know, I was a teacher for 10 years and I have such a deep respect for education, obviously, it's what, how I've spent my life. But you kind of forget like when it's something that you do all the time or it's the water that you swim in, you forget to appreciate what's in that water or, mm -hmm. or you know, the core skills and just the innovation, the hard work, um, the deep desire to connect with kids and to build meaning. Um, it's, you know, and just the creativity and like the, okay, this is the situation, let's figure it out. Like all of that's coming out and I feel like educators are shining in such a bright and beautiful way right now amidst all the challenges. Yeah. And then, uh, like, I was sitting in the backyard, and I don't know this teacher. She's a neighbor that I could hear, but I don't know. And I, and I was struck over the summer listening to her talk about setting up for the school year for her second grade or young mm. students and just as one moment. But I just knew that that's what's happening all over the country. So it yeah. was a really poignant moment. Yeah, that's really um, cool. Then we talked to Mateo Payne about Freedom yes, Schools. Did. Mm -hmm. And so Freedom Schools this summer during Shelter in Place showed up in incredible ways. So they, they were able to um, 
put together all the books that they use for Freedom Schools, deliver them to all the kids who were, engaged, who were enrolled in the program this summer and do a distance learning model of the Freedom Schools that Mateo talked about, where oh, wow. the kids came on every morning and all the kids had the books and, uh, and then they would go have, send the kids off to do some stuff in the middle of the day. But they were basically provided them with a summer Freedom Schools experience via distance learning uh, over the summer. And uh, I know uh, M Mateo isn't with Lincoln anymore, but he would, I could see that he was still involved in some of that. So I was grateful for his conversation. Yeah. And I mean, even like connecting back to the history, actually, like a two point bit of that history, yeah. which is um, I was helping Larry Cuban, our first guest on the show, clean out his office um, uh -huh. just before shelter in place. And he has a book and I've been actually been meaning to give it to you, Susan, and maybe we can give it to Mateo, but that chronicles um, Freedom Schools, um, the beginning stages of it. So it's an it's an older book, but it tells the story of Freedom Schools and how they began. <clears throat> oh, that's great! I will. I, so I, I snatched I, it I, off the shelves. Yeah, <laughs> holding on to it, waiting to give it to you. Um, yeah, such an inspiring model. And again, um, even related to this time, this idea of that we're all educators and we all have something to offer. And while traditional systems are really important, um, supporting our most um, vulnerable populations um is is job number one and it's been my biggest concern and freedom schools is an excellent model of that yeah uh our final guest for summer was charles cole dr charles cole and Can I just, before um, we go on to yeah. talk because i charles is doing so much right now but i want to say that we do have a number of people staying on with us right now oh, live good. and hey. i know that some of the work that that's been happening in oakland around and family engagement and freedom schools i think is part of that but but i know monera is on here and hey, Monera. She, the, uh, a freedom, <laughs> she is one of our parent uh, engagement uh, liaison. I think her, I'm not sure of her title exactly, but she does so much work with parents and the work that her, that the um, Office of Equity has done in Oakland this summer to prepare for the moment that we're in right now has really made it possible for kids to engage at the level they have. So I could see her on here and I wanted to say woohoo. Oh, I'm so excited that Monera is on here. And I mean, talk about an incredible advocate for students and families. And uh, she's totally the example of somebody who. Oh, um, her title is Regional Family Engagement Liaison for Middle School Network. So she just shared with us. Oh, go ahead, Monera. I see you. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Yeah, she is amazing, and she is one of those people that has just the world's biggest heart and is such an incredible um, community organizer. Mm -hmm. And she addresses families and meets them right where they are with the needs that they have right now. Um, it is fancy, Monera, as are you. <laughs> um, so, oh, I'm so excited that you're here, Monera. That makes me so happy. Um, yeah, so... Oh, we should we need to get Monera on. That's what yeah, we that's what we should get. All yeah. right, Monera, you're coming on the show. You're that's on that's the show. official. <laughs> it's happening. Yeah. Um, then we yeah, talked well, with Charles. Who, we talked with Charles. Charles Actually, Monera and I worked closely with Charles at one time. Yes. That's a good connection. And he's doing a ton. And he talked about kind of claiming and owning your own story. And that's a lot mm -hmm. of what the work that he does is claiming, is owning his story of being a child of parents who were addicted to crack cocaine and what happened to him and what happened to them, his parents, as they have um, since, since gotten into recovery and, you know, his journey through the education system. And um, he's been talking a lot this summer. So he has a couple different podcasts himself. And he is, I feel like every time I turn on Facebook, he's doing Facebook live. Yeah, he is. He's <laughs> all the time. I, mean, I watch the eight hand, his, he's two of the eight, eight hands black hands. Yeah. Eight mm -hmm. black hands. Um, and they've had some really powerful conversations about education, deep, Absolutely. deep stuff. And then um, I know he's had those conversations about how, so I really appreciate his voice and that mm -hmm. owning the narrative. And I, I, I think, supporting our young people to find their voice and to find their narrative incredibly important yeah yeah series three um which is i know near and dear to both of our hearts um is on immigration um mm -hmm. what was our immigration series and we did four parts on this one mm -hmm. and the first one we talked about immigration law and really just got some grounding in what was happening and how the immigration law and guidelines were changing or being differently interpreted under the trump administration um, and then we really started talking to people who 
are um, doing the work. So we spoke to Nicole Knight, who is leading the sanctuary, um, leading the whole district um, program in Oakland Unified around um, English learners, but also the sanctuary programs. Mm -hmm. And sanctuary programs means that um, Oakland is a sanctuary district. I mean, a sanctuary city and Oakland Unified is a sanctuary district, which means that um, they don't participate with ICE raids and it's a safe space for families um, that don't need to worry about, um, you know, it's a, you don't get as, I'm not describing sanctuary very well, but essentially like, um, you know, it's a safe haven for immigrant families. That's maybe the best way to describe it. Um, and Nicole's um, work is pretty incredible. Um, the way that she provides guidance for her students is really profound and, um, and she's really transformed the English language learner uh, program in Oakland, something that is um, really database-based, intentional, forward-thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, in a lot of districts, English learners, as with a lot of other um, underserved populations, can, can get kind of lost in the system. And I feel like Nicole's really done a great job, she and her colleagues and her team, to really um, elevate um, English learners and their needs to, um, she's right at the table with everyone yeah. else. And I'm, I'm, the network that I support has all of the dual language elementary schools and um, serves the majority of newcomers in the district. And I, uh, I, I'm so grateful for Nicole and the work that they've done and also see that in, in not only are they elevated, their needs are elevated, but we're able to recognize, I think because of her leadership, we're able to recognize the, the what they bring to our district as well. And mm. that, that having a second language and being, and that, students who are uh, native English speakers are able to benefit from being in dual language programs with students who are native Spanish or some other native language. Mm -hmm. um, and that it isn't a we're giving, it's a what do we have to give to each other? And that's been, I think, incredibly powerful. And a lot of that is due to Nicole's leadership. Yeah, yeah, I love that you named that. Um, then we had um, an interview with someone who I still just, I. Um, I revel at his courage and his humility, um, but we talked to Gustavo Garcia Rojas, um, who is an undocumented immigrant, and he came on and kind of named that and was a former recipient of the, the DACA program, the Deferred Action for Child And he graduated from Holy mm -hmm. Names with his master's degree in marriage and family therapy. And oh, go ahead, Gustavo. So yeah, that happens so since we spoke to is, him. He's working... Um, working with the immigrant community as well and in a clinical role. So mm. very grateful. To yeah, him. I was so appreciative of his willingness to step forward and kind of share his story uh, during a time when it can feel really frightening to share your story, um, you know, because uh, there have been a lot of attacks on immigrants um, during the Trump administration and a lot of rollbacks of rights and privileges that we've worked to put in place for immigrants. Um, especially children coming in, you know, mm -hmm. that are um, not making a choice to come here and they're here um, and, um, and they, you know, they identify with them, themselves as, and they feel more American than they do often from wherever they came from. Yep. Um, and yet they're not treated like citizens here. Um, so it's a really, it's a really painful dynamic. Yep. Yeah. We have so much work to do in this area and um, so much. And I, I'm, I've seen some things through social media lately, and I'm, I'm hoping they continue to elevate around like black and brown voices coming together to really highlight, uh, to highlight the inequality and the racism that permeates on both um, communities as, as a joint together through liberation. And um, we have so much work to do in this area. Yeah, it makes me really hopeful, and I and I we Susan and I talked a lot about it, and we kind of fell off with with giving updates, and that was our failing. And hopefully, we can come back with it. But part of what we spent a lot of last year doing was talking about uh, what was happening at the border, um, the U.S. Mexican border in particular, and the separation of children and families at the border. Um, and that's one of the most painful parts uh, for me of the last few years to witness and to feel besides us talking about using our platform, feeling so powerless to address. Um, which there are still is, children in cages. There are, there still, are still children, children in cages. There are still children who have been separated from their families for some of them more than a year. Mm -hmm. uh, the youngest case was a six month old separated from their mother. 
Um, and this is this does profound developmental damage, which we'll get to when we talk right. about our guests and, and trauma. trauma. Um, but this is traumatizing for children. It, would, it literally causes brain damage for them. Um, and it'll cause challenges for them as they grow and develop. Um, and it's an unnecessary and just cruel policy. Um, and I, the recent news, and I, I haven't followed up on it, but the recent news was that um, there was a ruling that we need to stop separating children from families. So there was a court ruling in support of, of, re, of keeping families together. But as we speak right now, there are families that are separated and um, are not connected. Um, so it's a really, it's a really big problem. And family, children got lost in the system. I mean, it's, it's profoundly damaging what's been happening. Then. <sighs> <laughs> breathe yeah and our topic after immigration yeah I was gonna say we also met with Laura Markham oh, that's um, right. I just want to say the Farley and, brothers yeah she's the author of a New York Times critically reviewed novel the faraway brothers and she and that that novel tells the story of of two brothers and what drove them to be um, to cross the US border and become United States citizens and gives you a real good glimpse and humanizes this, the, the plight of immigrants in a really powerful way. Cause I feel like a lot of times people say, well, well don't come here. You know, yeah. like if you're not legal, don't come here, but without actually understanding that there is no choice in a lot of cases and people are stuck between a rock and a hard place. And I feel like the Faraway Brothers does a really beautiful job describing that uh, and a yeah. specific like real life Voice. And, and it's been uh, it's been um, uh, adapted for young adult readers as well. Yes. So there is a young adult reader version. And I, I think one of the things that's so important about providing um, narrative experiences is just what you said. And I think when we humanize and, and there's a lot of uh, evidence out there that we need to have more stories told. And I think this connects back to Charles, right? When we, when we know someone's story and we know it from a human perspective, it, it allows us to, it touches our compassion in a way that we can join the fight from a humanistic perspective rather than from a data perspective. Yeah, I so appreciate you saying that, Susan. That's right, yeah. Um, our next series was food. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, that's right. And, I mean, we that, had the that, world's silliest show between the yeah. two of us. That was we'll we'll forget about that one. That was we'll, not we'll up. Pretend like we, that, yeah, didn't happen. that didn't happen. That was like that was our that's the its own blooper reel. That was that's yeah, a that whole is. hour of blooper. Hour blooper reel. Um, yeah, but, just skip but, it. It's cool. But the one with Jennifer Labar, I think, is our most viewed episode. So, so when we went into Shelter in Place and we could see how much food was the most, like, sort of thing that people were concerned about as families were so dependent on nutritional services. And when we uh, reposted that video, it got more views. That, that's a, our highest viewed episode. Yeah, absolutely. I think 18,000 people um, listened to that episode on Facebook alone. Um, mm -hmm. And that's really powerful. And yeah, so Jennifer Labar is a, is a brilliant leader in the nutrition services field. And she has done a lot of things um, to, you know, demystify the lunch lady, you know, ethos mm -hmm. and really show um, how important food services are and nutrition is for children. She does a lot of advocacy at the state level. Um, she's just a powerhouse and a really yeah. humble, excellent human being. You learn a lot about why nutrition services are important. And it's absolutely the first question I had when we went to shelter in place. I mean, it went like education and, and almost neck and neck was like, how are we feeding kids? Right. Just understanding and knowing how much kids are, are and families rely on nutrition services. I, I had the honor yesterday of, of working at the, one of the few dis, food distribution sites in Oakland. And my, my understanding is that, that before um, student IDs were required, we were giving 18,000 meals away every day that the food distribution was, was happening in Oakland. Um, and it's a lot lower now because students have to have, you know, there's a, little, a few more barriers. But when you think about how many people the school was feeding and keeping alive during this time, um, and they were healthy, nutritional meals and opportunities. And, and I just had the opportunity to connect with people. It's really powerful. Yeah, I did. I volunteered too. I'd hoped to do it all summer in my, my 
calendar. I know that's going to surprise you, Susan, got full. <laughs> um, but I did get to go and work in one of the schools and pack the bags um, that go to families. And it is, it's nutritional. Um, it was just, you know, I was just imagining like what a gift it is to be able to come up and get food and mm -hmm. how frightening it must be um, in this moment in time to know that you didn't have enough to feed your family. Um, so it's, it's just a great service. The other person we talked to in the series was uh, Delaine Easton, who's the former state superintendent of public instruction in California. And she actually talked about the policy part. So we do try and always talk policy to practice. Mm -hmm. And she gave some of the policy behind nutrition programs and services in the first place, the history of when they came about, um, why those, those services became a part of the education system. And, um, and she is a particular proponent of gardens and schools. So we talked about that as well. Yeah, and I've been gardening. I mean, that's what I've been doing during Shelter in Place is gardening, and, 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 and it reminds me how healing it is to get your hands in dirt and eat your own food. So hopefully when we go back into school buildings that um, others will have found a love for gardening. To, you know, I feel like that's one of those areas that is possible to be part of our reimagining in terms of science and, and, and nutrition. Well, and, you know, when I was an assistant principal, um, we had a little garden at our school and I would actually, when kids got in trouble, quote unquote, or they got sent to my office, often we would go out and we would just, we would, we would garden together and talk. Um, so it wasn't this place of getting in trouble, but it was a place of like, let's process together and kids that were regular, you know, frequent flyers, as we sometimes say in education that would come to me, they would ask for it. They'd see me in the yard and say, when can we do garden time again? And, Cause there was something really nurturing about touching the earth. And, you know, you're not sitting behind a desk with a power dynamic of, you know, the, the assistant principal and the kid in trouble, but mm -hmm. we just were talking to each other as people. And just was a really powerful um, way of connecting with kids. And I really appreciated it. So, yeah. All right, Susan, we got to move faster here. But we have I know, series, we got, series we're, we're, five we're on trauma. Um, yeah. Take it well, away, Susan. All right. Well, you know, I've been yours. steeped in trauma. <laughs> I've, I've, I've just completed phase one of the neurosequential. We had Dr. Oh, Bruce awesome. Perry, who... Uh, um, as many of you know, he's a leader in understanding child trauma uh, in the world. And I was so grateful to have him on and to be able to talk about some of the brain development around trauma and, and understanding development and, and, and how we can. And as you were talking about gardening, that's it, right? Like it's that regulate, relate, reason. And how being in the garden and how being in a parallel process is really trauma-informed. It's relational. It's giving kids what they need. And it's making sure adults are taken care of. And I think that leads to our next guest in trauma, who was on um, self-care and self-compassion. Yeah, Jacqueline Allison, who um, she uh, just finished her PhD and her study was on teacher compassion fatigue. And um, really what that means is that when we're not learning how to resource ourselves and take care of ourselves, then we are, our capacity to be able to provide care for our students diminishes over time. Mm -hmm which makes us a lot of rational sense. But again, often educators dismiss that. And right now, I mean, that's one of the areas that has come up repeatedly and repeatedly is this is such an incredibly difficult time for teachers. And I think when we first went into shelter in place, there was a lot of like, thank you teachers, appreciation of teachers. And I think as the discussion of in the building, out of the building, I really um, finding compassion for how difficult this time is and how much we're asking of our teachers. Uh, that that there's been a, a lot of emotional strain and stress. And so I've been working to try and create spaces for teachers to um, incorporate self-care, self-buddy, self-care buddies so that you have someone that you can check in with and just creating spaces for teachers to, to have compassion because it's an incredibly difficult time for them. Yeah, that's really important, Susan. And um, I totally agree. And, you know, I, I, I work and do teach a lot about mindfulness during my, my day job. And um, I, I've been really heartened to see how much self-care, self-compassion is starting to become something that people understand just inherently is necessary for us to provide to educators and to give them that space to have. Um, and um, yeah, we need to invest in this time. You know, the teachers are tr doing so much for their kids and they also have their own kids at home. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are having to face fears they have about being exposed to COVID if they go back mm -hmm. to school. I mean, it's just a really, it's a really tough situation. Yeah. Um, and then we ended with um, trauma-informed practices. Yeah, with Angela and Gemma from Montana who are implementing the Bruce Perry's um, 
neurosequential model in, with students and children um, and just talking about the challenges of creating trauma-informed classrooms with early childhood and working with families who are in uh, stressful situations. And I, I've, I've had a, a, quite a bit of contact with Angela over the summer and working with families in, in, in this new reality and how to be trauma-informed. Mm. Um, so, it, it, like teachers, and I think many families who are already under an enormous amount of stress have been under more stress than ever, and switching to telehealth for mental health has um, been a big shift for a lot of mental health providers, and sort of how do we support families to, to take care of each other and take care of their space. So. That was time. All of the, all of our shows have been so timely. <laughs> They're so timely, and the information is still so relevant. So, I mean, I think we're really hoping, and we're taking the time to reintroduce our shows now with the hope that you'll go back and listen to them because it's really powerful, well, worthwhile information, absolutely applicable in this moment. And um, we've just been so gifted with some really brilliant guests, and we will have more coming forward, but um, yes. really brilliant guests talking about stuff that's um, so relevant in education. But today. we are running out of time, and so we got to okay. get through the other. It's, not, it's my fault, too. I talk, We talk too much. That's good. Okay. We did a series on mindfulness. I'm going to go quick through mindfulness. Um, we talked to three excellent educators about mindfulness, one of whom is my namesake, or I'm, her, I'm older, so she's my namesake, <laughs> another Megan Sweet. Um, but we talked about mindfulness and, and social emotional learning and how mindfulness plays a vital role in education. Um, I talk a lot about this professionally, so I don't feel a lot of fire to talk about it now, but it's, we have really great interviews. So please do don't, have take, really great interviews. don't take the, my lack of discussion now um, for anything other than the fact that we got a boogie. But um, yeah, the and that Mina, learned about I really powerful the models. Around, the Mina's conversation really is mm -hmm. really insight, had a lot of. Um, She's moving forward SEL and mindfulness, and I think that there's that's a great episode as well. Yeah, and she talks also a lot about um, how mindfulness and SEL are really essential for us to have as we enter into conversations about race and bias, and mm -hmm. um, she's a big advocate there. So it's very, very powerful interview. So please check those out. Um, our next one was on administrators, Susan. I know. We talked with Ashley, right, a shelter in place. When I, I right as it went in, and she was like in the thick of it, and so mm -hmm. we had to hopefully we'll be able to follow back up with her to kind of see how it's evolved to this point. But that was a very timely sort of in the mind of a principal. Yeah, we got to watch a principal's wheels turning as she was trying to figure out mm -hmm. um, how to navigate, you know, like all the questions that were top of mind for her. I mean, what a what a bit of gold for anybody who wants to study administrators and what's happening in this time. We also talked to a district leader, Sarah Stone, um, about what it is to lead um, a district and what are the ways that she thinks about that. That was also a really popular show and one that folks really connected with and actually is often our, our most commonly downloaded one. Yeah. Um, so it's one that people really are learning a lot about. And then we talked with a principal from Inner City School, um, who you work with really closely, mm -hmm. and Amoy Booker. Um, about He's also her working leadership. really hard at the trauma-informed. So yes. it's she through is. arts. Our final series, look how fast we can move when we force ourselves. It's amazing. Um, this is the one I would love to talk about for two hours, probably. But um, our final series was on kids. And we I spoke know. with kids um, and, and caught up with them as they were navigating shelter in place. Mm -hmm. um, and the first two parts of our three-part series on kids were interviewing high school seniors, which I thought was just a really sweet and um, poignant um, series of conversations with high school seniors in the midst of shelter in place, navigating what it is to graduate without any of the bells and whistles that normally come with being a senior in high school. And I'm pretty sure Jason and Jay, I know Jay Walt was with our arts for, for kids, but he, uh, they have both gone off to college at this point. So it's going to be a different kind of college experience, but I'm pretty sure I saw that they headed off. So I'm, I'm curious what that experience is like, and maybe at some point we can catch up with them. But kids are this is what it's all about the kids right that's right and our, our our third one in that series was creative kids and we interviewed kids so we interviewed two two twins mm -hmm. um one in our high school senior um series and the other one in creative kids um and, and jay walt um one of those seniors uh, has since released an album and it's blown um, up and See? it's blown up um and he couldn't be more sweet and humble and just um 
powerful. So it's a great interview to hear hear Jay Walt. He is off to school. They did like a a magazine or newspaper article. I guess the New New York Times featured yeah, him. Like that. Yeah. Um, so it's a really cool um, a really cool uh, episode, and we have links to his album on our page uh, on our web page uh, at um, yourthreeeyes.com. And we also interviewed kids that are just doing good things with their time off. So kids that are um, making jewelry for jewelry. for a cause. Um, an eight know. an eight year old who's like into Barbie fashion, Barbie fashion um, who, you know, we need to give her her own show because she took <laughs> over. Um, and then some kids like a brother and sister that um, Kai and Bailey, who are just incredibly sweet with each other and great musicians. Yeah, they're like parent goals around siblings, uh, which no interactions with my sisters and I even now look like that. So let's just say. And, and uh, their mom, Rachel, who is also in education, who I'm hoping that we can get on, just completed a study around how arts in education actually increases academic performance. And it, so it just it just was released and it was a several year study, which some of our Oakland schools were participated in. So maybe at some point, because both of those kids are really artistic, and I think you could see the richness in, in, in the research study that she did. So, Yeah, you know, it'd be really cool to do an arts and education one. Um, yeah. So yeah, that'd be cool. Um, you know, and, and that's actually the, the, the good pivot point for us to talk a little bit about what's coming up next. So if you're joining us live, or if you're listening to this later, and, and you're on Facebook, please like drop us a line and tell us a series that you'd be interested in, especially if you have people that you think would be powerful for us to talk to. Mm -hmm. um, education is a deep and wide subject, and there's lots of ways we could go. Um, and we can always revisit some of these topics again with different um, different perspectives. It's all about hearing from different people and, and what feels important to them. Yeah. Um, but we have two series that we are booking at the moment, and we'll be recording um, imminently. Um, do you want to describe one of them, Susan? Uh, so we are going to have a series on um, education finance, which I think is a particularly timely as we look at the economy changes and the, and the shifts in, in needs and funding. So we're going to talk to some folks in education who really understand the way both finance works and what, what to do in the building on how to make the most of your money. Yeah, I think just clarifying that there's been a lot of news in the in the media about um, Betsy DeVos, who's the U.S. Department of Education um, secretary and um, her efforts to actually defund some of the programming that speaking of nutrition, other things that actually serve our, our highest need folks. So some of the funding that's that's at risk right now are things like special education funding and nutrition services. And those are the populations that need our, our support. Um, and it, it's complex right stuff, and and, mm -hmm. and and this is an area that Megan is definitely far more uh, uh, informed my chance than to geek I out. am. <laughs> and her chance to geek out, but it's such a it, it it really plays into everything. So we think it's in, in, important for people to understand funding so that we can make informed conversations about things. Yes, please don't not. Does, so my experience as a career educator who's been focused on education finance is as soon as I say education finance, you see like a little bit of glaze going over people's eyes and I can almost see them like mentally or physically <laughs> backpedaling from me so they don't have to talk to me about education finance. Um, but we promise to make it incredibly interesting and um, and vital because it plays such a, a crucial role in the work that we do. And there's so much mm -hmm. misinformation that will try and give you information, but then also really practical examples of, of how education finance influences what our kids' experiences are. So we're excited to talk about that. And we are also going to be talking about equity in education. And, and equity is, is a through line throughout all of our conversations, I feel like, yeah. Susan. And Absolutely. we talk about it a lot, but we're going to focus specifically on um, educators of color and leaders of color during this time um, and ask them uh, about their experiences um, being in the education system and also what they see and what they hope for in this moment where there's a lot more awareness and um, support for initiatives. So my daughter's at the door because I got to get her book. <laughs> Close the book. The, oh no! So I, I know, and we talked way over when we thought we were going to. I know we did. Okay, we're, uh, we're, I'm sorry, Izzy. We'll be finishing up right now. We promise. Yes, uh, and so those are the two that we have booked that are coming. Yes. And but we really do want your input, so um, we encourage you to share ideas, share topics. 
uh, participate. We're going to try and do more Facebook Live, so we, we're, we're watching your feedback and want to incorporate your conversation um, when we're recording. So we thank all of you. We're excited to be back. We're excited for Season 2. Yeah, well, welcome back to Season 2 of The Awakening Educator. Susan, I couldn't be more excited to be doing this with you. Me too. Um, enjoy <laughs> going to buy books. Oop, the dog's barking. Everyone's ready for us to stop, so we're going to stop now. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Class is dismissed. Wasn't that fun? Susan and Megan are always happy to greet you on the next episode of The Awakening Educator. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Education is the foundation for a brighter future. Open your eyes to The Awakening Educator.